This week on the Pro Wrestling Podcast, podcast, Cody Rhodes leaves AEW, possibly heading to WWE, most likely. Also, Tony Khan responds. We have Brock Lesnar on the Pat McAfee show, talking all kinds of shit. And AJ Lee pops back up. Talking women of wrestling. I'm your host, Seth Grimes, and this is the one and only Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast! Huge news this week coming out of Fightful.com via Sean Ross Sapp. Breaking the news that Cody Rhodes has officially parted ways with AEW. Check out this clip. It is February 15th, 2022. This is Fightful Wrestling and this is a breaking news show Cody Rhodes and Brandy Rhodes have left WWE or left AEW rather. Man, I got so far ahead of myself. They left AEW, have been in talks with WWE. Uh, we broke the story on FightfulSelect.com. And minutes later, Cody Rhodes, Brandy Rhodes, AEW, Tony Khan all uh, confirmed the news. Whew. Oh, man, the first big defection from AEW. This is a juicy, juicy topic. So much speculation going on as to why Cody's leaving AEW, where Cody's going to be going from AEW. I've heard he's going to go to the NWA and have a run with his buddy Matt Cardona, and they're going to be the two-man power trip of NWA and just elevate the company to the next level i've heard that he's gonna go in and buy ring of honor <clears throat> imagine that money bags cody rhodes right the million dollar man multi-million dollar man cody rhodes as we all know him to be just balling dropping money everywhere he goes right to buy an entire wrestling company he's gonna buy ring of honor and start another New wrestling promotion. We've heard he could go back to New Japan or make any other number of random indie dates. We even heard that he may just be going to Hollywood, that he's done with the wrestling. He's been talking about this forever. He's only got a couple years left in his wrestling, and he wants to go off and do movies and stuff like that. You know, we've always heard his entire career. Dusty talked about it in his book when Cody, before Cody even became a wrestler, that that Cody wanted to be an actor. So, you know, you got Rhodes to the top. You got the big show, the Go Big Show. Well, well, it's the Go Big Show. You got <clears throat> all these options for Cody Rhodes. But I'm going to tell you right now, and if I'm wrong, I will pull my sock off my foot and I will eat it as is, covered in cat hair and lint and dust and floor debris, little shreds of cheese from my shredded cheese that I like to sprinkle on top of things. Don't judge my socks, all right? We're not here to talk about my feet. We're here to talk about Cody Rhodes. There's only one place that Cody's going, folks. He's going to WWE. Of course he's going to WWE. What on earth could compel a guy like Cody Rhodes in a position as he sat at AEW? You seen him. He was at the table. At Gorilla, right? At the go position, they call it. Right there next to Tony with his headset on. <clears throat> He's had that EVP status, even though we've heard that that's been greatly reduced, if not just, you know, in name only, basically, at this point. Uh, EVP-ino, EV-pino, 
You get what I'm trying to say, right? So, how bad could AEW? I mean, he had this deal with TBS to be on their show. He had this deal with TNT to be on their show. Cody was, he was, you know, had an office, I believe, as far as we're aware. And what we've heard, he did the community outreach program. Um, you know, we had heard that he was beefing with the other EVPs once upon a time, but even that has seemed to be smoothed over and, and, um, by all accounts, they've been getting along great lately as well. Um, but there is some that would say that Cody is a little bit, um, there's a bit of a divide in the AEW locker room where there are a, a lot of people that Cody doesn't associate with anymore or at all. Uh, maybe Cody has his click, and then there's other people. But isn't that <clears> – <throat> that's the wrestling business, right? Like, that's just exactly how it's always been. It's There's clicks. There's the click, but there's always been clicks and, and little factions and friend groups backstage. And everybody can't be friends with everybody, right? Even though Jim Cornette calls it all friends wrestling. Everybody can't be friends with everybody, but – <clears throat> my guess is this Cody's contract was coming up and I in and Sean Ross Sapp had said this in his report too that Cody was thinking CM Punk money you know he's thinking you know uh, he, Cody was even heard as saying in interviews talking about the, the pay tier system that they have in AEW and, uh, you know, there's main eventer. And then even above that was Chris Jericho money, as he put it. And I imagine that has carried over to CM Punk, probably Daniel Bryanson. And, uh, <clears throat> and rightfully so, by the way. I mean, they're huge gets. And, and obviously, um, you know, one could argue they're bigger stars than Cody is. But Cody wanted that kind of money. And apparently... Uh, Tony Khan just didn't see it like that. Now, to be that integrated with the company that you were there, like basically you're a founder of the company and you are still holding the title of an executive vice president of that company and you leave. Cody had this high opinion of himself and probably rightfully, we know Brandy does. Brandy's got a Fucking, which by the way, Brandy's a great talent too. Like we all hate Brandy, um, but I think we all kind of love to hate her. I mean, she's got go away heat, but it's like fun to not like her. <clears throat> and she she does she brings it on herself. You know, it's not like she doesn't go out of her way to be as. Uh, divisive as possible or abrasive is maybe even the better word. I uh, like this picture she put on Twitter of herself. Said she got boots that says "rich as rich AF," you know, "rich as fuck." Like why, why, other than to just troll people and be a dick, right? So I think it came down to the money and. AEW is a crowded place nowadays. Cody's not exactly the main eventer. He's not exactly lined up to be a main eventer or the champion there anytime soon. And, you know, you could argue as an EVP, uh, it's more his job to help build talent than be the top talent. But Cody's often said in interviews that he's only got a few more years. That he's looking at maybe 40-ish and he's going to be done. Okay, he's close to that. <clears throat> Whatever contract he's going to sign next, like a three-year contract, might be his last full-time contract. And Cody is looking to get the absolute maximized value out of his brand, out of himself, out of the work he's put in for himself that he can get right now because this is the money that's going to this is it for him. He's probably not going to be wrestling through his 40s. He, he doesn't want to anyway. So he's looking to just make as much money off of wrestling right now and uh, maximize his star power, <clears throat> not just for that fat paycheck, but to 
and, you know, royalties that will come with that and all of that, but to also possibly get those opportunities to be more of a mainstream star and to to be, uh, to get the chance to be in movies and things like that. So, honestly, I think at the end of the day, Cody probably wanted to stay with AEW. I think his heart is there. But his greed and his ego and his knowing that his career is running short in ring. And Brandy, obviously, I'm sure had a lot to do with this decision and her greed and her ego. And they went with the money. I think when Cody didn't re-sign because him and Tony were just so far off on where they were willing to be money-wise, I think that's when in, in, in Cody was technically a free agent. I think he took that time to see what the other side might offer him. And now he knows what kind of money could be coming from WWE. And we also know that... WWE is fickle and they don't, there's no job security. And the other con, Nick Khan, could end up firing Cody or, you know, suggesting more cuts. Cody is not guaranteed a job for the length of time he signs a contract for. But if he is, <clears throat> I'm willing to bet he got offered a big old sack full of monies, as Dan Housen would say. A blimp, all of it. To pull a founding member of AEW, to pull a EVP from AEW over to WWE is quite the coup. It's quite the get. It's quite the uh, quite the win for WWE, and it gets eyes looking the other way. And look, folks, this isn't this is inevitable, right? <clears throat> it's. Everybody's going towards W or a everybody's going towards AEW now because it's a new company and WWE's kind of shitty to work for and sucks and all that. But there's gonna be plenty of guys that go from AEW to WWE as well. Uh it's new, but you know, give it a few years. We're gonna start to see some shit, right? MJF openly. Openly talks about how he's willing to to take offers from WWE and go there if the money's right. And the money will be right for anybody that wants to go to WWE. <clears throat> There's going to be some that are AEW loyalists, like Sting always was in his career, and rightfully so. And There's going to be people that are maybe don't think they're quite good enough to make it in WWE or don't think they'll get over or get used as well. Um, I wouldn't expect to see a Darby Allen go to WWE, for example, I, uh, based on one of the two or a combination of both the AEW loyalty. Look, they made him a star and two, he's so damn small. Like, what are they going to, they're going to change everything about him and make him wrestle for the, the cruiserweight title in NXT. Like, <clears throat> but guys like MJF, Brian Cage has been itching to get out. I'm assuming. Um, there's going to be more. There's going to be defectors. But Cody's a big one. Cody's a big, big, big. I mean, I, this is shocking. This is big news. And this will be a big win. And mark my words, he's going to WWE. I'll eat my sock on video if he doesn't go to WWE. And I, as far also uh, as far as uh, Sean Ross Sapp had said, Cody has no non-compete. So... He's free to join WWE tomorrow. You know, he can be on fucking, he can be on Monday Night Raw this Monday if they want him to be. My guess is they will put him into play prior to WrestleMania, maybe the night after Elimination Chamber, you know, <clears throat> Monday Night Raw. And put him in play for WrestleMania, and, and it's going to turn the wrestling world on its ass. You know, you could do any number of things. Uh, you know, you could put him into a title picture. You could feud him with Roman, or you could feud him with Lashley. You could feud him with Seth. You could do a mixed tag with Seth and Becky versus Brandy and Cody. You could do all kinds of weird things. 
Um, Cody's going to be around a while. I think he's going to be a big, big star. And look, I think he's going to do well in WWE. I don't think this is going to be a stardust thing. Um, you know, it is always possible that they just w, uh, WWE just buries him, right? But that's going to set a bad example, too, to other talent. Like, good luck getting an MJF or a Wardlow to jump ship over to WWE when you can't point to Cody or anybody else that came over and be like, see, look how big of a star we made. Like, WWE was able to take, in the Attitude Era, they were able to take Chris Jericho and the Radicals, and they were able to make them bigger stars than they were in WCW. I hesitated there because Chris Benoit was their world champion, uh, you know, before he was released. But for all intents and purposes, they were all kind of mid to lower card guys. And WWE elevated them. So they can't just bring in Cody and bury him and then expect to be able to woo anybody over because everybody knows, and this was the other thing that's going to scare AEW guys from going to WWE, is all the horror stories. I mean, I think any level of wrestling fan that's any bit of a mark and not just there for a paycheck, they're in their heart of hearts, they want that WrestleMania moment. They want to work for WWE. They want to meet Vince McMahon. They want to, you know what I mean? Like, they want that experience. They grew up in WWE. Unfortunately, what we hear from the business side of WWE compared to the mythical fucking magic world that we all live in as fans where it's all rainbows and unicorns and, yay, I'm living my dream, but... You realize your dream comes with a dick up the ass when you get to WWE for real. But I think this will be different for Cody. I think he's going to get there, and I think he's going to get put right into the mid, top of the mid to the bottom of the main event. Um, I think he'll, within the year, he'll be doing main events. He'll be getting title shots. I don't know if he'll be a champion this year. But I really think they're going to give him the old AJ Styles push. And they're really just going to, you know, when AJ came in, he was given every bit of credibility he walked through the door with. You know, he did have to earn it to a certain extent, but it didn't take long. I mean, he was a pretty much a top guy from day one, right? And Cody's going to be a top guy from day one. Maybe they bury him towards the end of his contract so that he loses value on going back to the AEW. <sighs> if that's what he wants to do. Um, you know, he had a job for life there. I'm kind of torn on this, because as a wrestling fan and living through the Attitude Era, it is exciting when you see people jump ship. And when you see Cody Rhodes come out to WWE, Monday Night Raw or SmackDown, he might even have the same music. Apparently he owns that music, his entrance music. So... You know, unless WWE wants to be douchebags and they tell them absolutely not, you know, their AEW doesn't legally own that music. So Cody can take that with him and do what he wants with it. See him and Brandy come out, the pop that that's going to get, and the promo that he has the ability to cut if they don't script it all the shit or if he doesn't get interrupted right away and they turn it into some douchebag angle. Let him debut. Let him cut a fucking... 10, 15 minute promo. Then, if you want to bring out, you know, Seth or Bobby or Lesnar or Roman or whoever he's going to feud with, then you can do that. And I think that's perfect. And then you just, you're off and running and, and, and we'll see where he goes, you know, keep him in, in your top spots. And I think Cody's going to hold that ground. I think he's going to be in a higher position in WWE ironically, than he would have been in AEW uh, if he stayed. But ultimately, this is it's, it's a money thing, and it's a legacy thing, I think, too. No pun intended, or pun intended maybe, just a little bit. Who knows? Cody knows that this is probably going to be his last big run. He may do another run after that, but that might be his run where he's putting everybody else over. These are his prime money-making, star power years. And he believes that he makes CM Punk money. Tony Khan didn't see it that way. We love you, dude. We appreciate everything you do. I can't pay you that much money. 
Cody bet on himself. He said, okay, then. I think I'm going to go see what the E has to offer. The E had a lot to offer, clearly. Otherwise, he would have stayed with AEW because he's not going to go. He's not going to leave AEW to go fucking dabble in the NWA or go fucking. Oh, I'm going to be in New Japan strong all of a sudden. No. And he's not buying Ring of Honor. Cody's going to A or Cody. <laughs> Cody's going to WWE. He's going to be a WWE superstar. And he's going to do a great job. But I'm like I said, I'm torn. Because I want to see that. That pop's going to be great. Look, when we're talking all-time wrestling moments, this is going to be a fucking moment, okay? This is going to be a huge moment. This will be that one that's on DVDs and documentaries and retold over and over the day that Cody jumped ship and, and made his debut back on Raw or SmackDown and the promo that he cuts. It's going to be a beautiful thing. But after that, is it just going to be boring WWE shit again? I think so. I think, you know, it'll, it's going to give a good pop for WrestleMania and it'll carry a little bit of buzz with it uh, for a few months. But I think once the shine wears off after, you know, the first year and Cody just kind of blends in with everybody else on the WWE roster and becomes just a boring fuck over there and everything's... 50 50, and oh, he got a disqualification, and oh, he got counted out. And, uh, I mean, you know, it's coming. <clears throat> He's not going to change WWE. WWE is not going to magically become this awesome, booked, fun to watch, great promotion just because Cody's there. But we're going to get that moment, and we're going to get that first month, couple month run, at least the road to WrestleMania run. It's going to be a thing of beauty. It really is. And it's a blow to AEW. So I'm going to enjoy that, but I'm an AEW fan over WWE. WWE did me dirty. They're boring. Their booking sucks. They just, they have beat me into not even wanting to watch their shows. Like, it's bad. It's really bad. And I know there's diehard loyalists that are listening that love WWE and everything, and, like, more power to you, dude. Like, I'm, I'm not here to talk you out of it. I want you to like wrestling, and whatever type of wrestling you like, you like. But I was damn near out of wrestling completely. Like, I had gotten to the point where I was just watching the pay-per-views, and then I started not even watching the pay-per-views. And I was getting more into, like, what New Japan was doing and, like, anything that was going on outside WWE because it was a little bit more exciting. And then AEW started, and, you know, you, you can list off any flaws or things you don't like about AEW, but to me it's been a breath of fresh air. It's been, it's been, it's kept me in the wrestling game, you know. And uh, I really would have thought Cody was going to be loyal to the end there. You know, I thought he was going to be a lifer. It was the house he held built. And, you know, uh, obviously, I think, unless he's just hated backstage and he's miserable there, I think this is a, a clear example of just flat-out greed. And I don't blame him. I mean, like I said, this is Cody's time to maximize himself and make as much money as he can as Cody Rhodes. This run can set him up for a lifetime. You know, he can get movie deals out of this, bigger name power, name value. You know, his last run with WWE was fucking Stardust or the fucking dashing Cody Rhodes with a mask and a mustache and he was scrawny and he's he's going back there a way different guy. And and he has the ability to really, really set himself up for life. And I think he will. He's going to be an all-timer after this run. But, I mean, it lets me down at the same time, man. Like, I, I like... It is a wrestling business. But the fact that he was the EVP and he was a founder, he was just so inside the, the inner workings of everything and... We always talked about how he loves it there and all his young kids that he's helping get in there and train and, and build up and working with Amanda Huber on the community outreach stuff. Like, 
to me, it's just flat out greed. And it makes me look down on them just a little bit, a lot of bit, to be honest with you. But I understand it, and I'm still excited to see that that WrestleMania run. And then after that, you know, I, I w- we'll see. We'll see what kind of run he has. I he honestly think he'll kind of start to blend in after a while and just become another WWE guy. And he'll probably be... Probably be regretting the creative when it's all said and done, but probably not the paychecks, right? So we'll see. I don't have much more else to say about it, but this is massive. And this is a big game changer in wrestling. And it certainly makes this WrestleMania season uh, very exciting. So let's keep an eye on it and see where things go. Well, after all those shenanigans, Tony Khan was on Busted Open later on in the week, and he was asked flat out by Dave LaGreca about the Cody Rhodes situation. He didn't say much, but he did say this. Check out this clip. Speaking of moments, Tony, since we have you, and I know you haven't really mentioned anything publicly, so we always appreciate uh, the fact that you come on here on this show. Uh Two people that gave a lot of moments to AEW, Cody Rhodes and Brandy Rhodes, uh, sending out the statement earlier this week that there's, they're no longer with AEW, came as a bit of a shock to me as a fan. Uh, but, but talk a little bit about Cody and Brandy and how much they gave AEW in the time that they were with your company. Well, uh, I put out statements uh, that were from the heart and really positive, and I meant it. Uh, you know, I, I wish them both really well, and I appreciate everything they did here in their different roles in the company. And uh, it's very sad and, I you know, not something uh, any of us wanted to happen, I think. But um, I believe that Cody's got uh, something else, you know, in the works. I'm not sure about that, but we'll see. Uh, I'm sure they're going to have great opportunities in wrestling and in life. And, you know, uh, you never know what's going to happen in the future. I wish them the best and, and very appreciative for everything they did here. I kind of have not been talking a lot about it. And, uh, you know, Dave, I love love coming on and talking to you. So you've probably pried more out of me than anybody else. And I've honestly said nothing to you either here. So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, dude, it's, it's super clear that, Tony doesn't sound happy about it. Uh, he doesn't really want to talk about it. Doesn't have much to say. Um, he, you know, is of the utmost professionalism and thanking and being thankful for Cody. But you can tell by his voice. He's, he's either mad about it or hurt by it or both. You know, I think... Uh, it's so hard because we've heard so much this week, right? About, uh, you know, was Cody even liked? You know, a lot of rumors of the locker room being happy that Cody and Brandy were gone, you know, like that they were like a negativity, like they were weighing people down back there. You know, there were people that were just, that were happy that they were gone uh, privately. Um, but. I don't know. Tony sounds, like I said, he sounds either mad or hurt or a mixture of both. And uh, depending on, you know, how things went down, you know, I think Tony Tony put a lot into Cody. And you know what? Maybe from Cody's perspective, Cody put a lot into Tony. You know, Cody signed on thinking he was going to be an EVP and then he became an EVP in name only and lost a lot of the stroke that he had backstage. And now he's not getting the big CM Punk Brian Danielson contract. Uh, So maybe, you know, Cody in his mind felt like it was time to leave. And Tony in his mind felt like he opened the door uh, to to Cody, opened his business to Cody, gave Cody a lot of opportunities to be a big player in the company and not just a wrestler wrestler. And, you know, it just sounds like a lot of a sore, sore wounds and soft spots. And, and uh, it's a touchy subject right now. So we'll see how all this plays out. I mean, Cody's definitely going to WWE, but uh, 
you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, as the years go on, what ends up being said about this, you know, how this, you know, what more can come out when people start doing actual interviews uh, where they do say more about it and we can hear exactly what happened and, and how these guys felt about it. Barack Lesnar was on the Pat McAfee show this week. I don't normally listen to Pat McAfee. I'm not into the sports ball thing. But I listened this week because Brock was on there and it made the big headlines on the internet about Brock saying that he don't give a shit about his legacy and the Hall of Fame and all of that. That's what you guys heard from the uh, show that kind of made the news. But I wanted to pluck this other piece out from the show that I thought was really fascinating. There was a lot. I, I highly recommend... Honestly, just go listen to the whole thing. I highly recommend, like, if you listen to anything that I'm plugging here this week, go listen to the Pat McAfee interview with Brock Lesnar. It's on YouTube and shit. Uh, if you haven't heard it already, the whole thing is really interesting. You get a whole different side of Brock. Um, I mean, you don't... He's exactly like you know him to be, but he's it's still... He's fascinating to listen to. And he's in a little bit more of a relaxed, laid-back, friendly environment than he was in, say, like, the Broken Skull Sessions, right? Where he's kind of doing the wrestling interview thing still. But, like, here it's like he's hanging out with a bunch of buddies, kind of. And uh, in this clip here I wanted to present, he kind of compares, he was asked... Uh, Pat McAfee brings up that Vince and Dana are often compared as being very similar. So he asked Brock how he sees both uh, Vince and Dana and how he compares the two. Check out this clip. Very fascinating. Whenever you do business outside the WWE, and everybody calls Dana basically a spitting image of Vince just in a different fight game. Do you agree with that? Uh, I don't know. I, I really can't compare the two guys. They're just so, I mean, honestly, my relationship with Vince is so different than it is with Dana over the years. Um, Vince and I have had a love hate relationship for, you know, the last 20 years, but it's been good. We've got a lot of water under the bridge. I have a lot of respect for both men. Um, and, but you know, things dealing with Dana and, and it's just a totally different. You met Vince approach. when you were younger. I met Vince when I was younger. I look at Vince more as a father figure actually, you know, because of, I've learned a lot of things from him and I was able to carry those things over and you and handle business with Dana. So, I mean, <clears throat> Vince is a self-made person. So is Dana, you know? Yeah, so the way Brock looks at it, he sees them completely different. He almost sounded like uh, he's not as friendly with Dana as maybe we thought. I don't know if they had a fallen out at some point. Uh, if something happened where he's not as high on Dana as he used to be. But... To hear him say, like, he considers Vince a father figure, like, that's so fascinating to listen to. And we hear that a lot, right? Vince is the father figure. A lot of the wrestlers look up to Vince. Uh, sounds like Brock has a shit ton of respect for Vince. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, Brock's a legend. And he will be a Hall of Famer. He's one of the best to ever do this, Period. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if anybody what anybody says about his move set or whatever or like his love for caring, you know, if he's a Hall of Famer or not. Brock's a legend. And I think he'll be remembered. I think history will remember him well. The Undertaker has been announced as the first inductee into the 2022 WWE Hall of Fame. And boy, oh boy, if there was ever a Hall of Famer, if there was ever you know, a worthy entrance into the Hall of Fame, Undertaker, I'll be quite honest, you know, I heard this uh, uh, proposed on Busted Open, I think it was Dave LaGreca who mentioned that Undertaker should be in the Hall of Fame by himself, and I hadn't really ever thought about that, but I 100% agree, man. Just make him the only entrant into the Hall of Fame this year and have multiple people talk about him. Have a couple people come up. Because Undertaker's career 
has been longer than anybody else in the history of the Hall of Fame. You know, his career has spanned from all the, the I mean, forever since 93 was his debut, right? Or no, 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 91. 90, yeah, 91, 92, 90, it was 91. Uh, the Survivor Series, 1991 Survivor Series. Was it 90? Jesus Christ, I don't know. The Undertaker is an OG as fuck. He has been through so much, such an integral part of the WWE for so many years. He's accomplished everything there is. He is absolutely the greatest character. You know, like like Ric Flair's not really a character. Hulk Hogan's not really a character. John Cena's not really a character. But The Undertaker, that's a character, right? The dead man. The fucking Grim Reaper. The Reaper of Wayward Souls. The Ministry of Darkness. This motherfucker, when when he came out, he was a zombie. I was a little kid at the time. That man was dead, and I believed it. I believed he is not alive. He is not human. Bobby Heenan put that over all the time. Every time Taker would get hit and no-sell it, Heenan would be like, he's not human. And I was like, that's right. He's not human, that guy. The Undertaker, man, fucking legend. Uh, I won't say too much more about it. I just wanted to give him props. Uh, you know, a Hall of Famer. If there ever was a Hall of Famer, it's The Undertaker. Yeah, I don't know if he's the great. He's not the greatest wrestler of all time, but all that's subjective, too. You know, like when you say who's the greatest of all time, is it in ring, technical stuff? Is it. Box office draw, you know, there's two clear distinctions there. Maybe you define the best as the person who has uh, reached the highest of both. There's a big box office draw and can work. But when you want to talk like, I mean, it is undeniable that the greatest character ever in the history of pro wrestling and, and, and certainly one of the best wrestlers, period, Obviously, box office draws, check. Can work in the ring, check. The Undertaker, man. Fucking incredible. So mad props to The Undertaker in the Hall of Fame. And I hope they do. I hope they just induct him by himself. They probably won't. I'm sure they won't. But it would be very cool if they did. They flipped up the format and just did something special for him specifically to just honor him the whole night. One entrant. Several inductors, several, uh, maybe not inductors, uh, maybe one person inducts him, maybe Vince does or something, but then, you know, you get Kane and you get Foley and you get all these guys that were close to him in his career to come out and, and say their piece about The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, you know what I mean? Like, how fucking great would that be? Anyways, on to the next motherfucker. AJ Lee, a.k.a. AJ Mendez, randomly popped up on Wrestling with Freddy. That's uh, Freddy Prince Jr., the Scooby-Doo actor, and I know what you did last summer. Married Sarah Michelle Gellar, lucky fuck. Turned wrestling writer. Now has a wrestling podcast where he talks all about his wrestling writing days and all the uh, kind of backstage stories and stuff from his time that he spent in WWE. But on this episode, he had a guest. Not just any guest, but the very rarely appearing, very rarely heard from, very much missed by the wrestling fans... Miss AJ Lee, a.k.a. AJ Mendez, a.k.a. AJ Brooks, April Brooks, whatever the fuck you want to call her. It's Phil's, Phil's wife. Phil's wife, okay? She was on the Freddie Prince Jr. Wrestling with Freddie podcast talking about women of wrestling. She didn't talk a lot about like her whole WWE run or anything like that, but she did. Uh, talk about wrestling in the sense of her new project. Check out this clip. You know, it's it's really 
what inspired me to join WOW was the idea that it was women behind the scenes in every capacity and women in front of the camera in every capacity. And to me, I love wrestling and I never stopped love res- loving wrestling. Um, and this was like the perfect way to rejoin the world of wrestling, but also combine it with what I'm doing now and what I have a passion for now. And so I'll be executive producer alongside Jeannie and David McLean, which is my That's so sick. That's so Um, sick. I'm so happy for you. Oh my gosh. And then I want to talk to her on the phone, you know, um, she really just kind of laid it out there of like what she wants us to be and what the vision is. And, um, and then also left a lot of space for what I want it to be or what I could bring to the table. And I really appreciate that. Her old man did that too. Yeah. yeah. I just, I think that that's the right way to start something. It's, you know, we know that people know what the product is or they know what it was before, but this is going to be a new beast. And um, we're really excited about that. And it's, it's, it's a great group of women. Um, and I, somewhere along the way, just kind of got inspired to say, okay, I'm also going to do color commentary. <laughs> I I knew it. I knew it. I was actually going to ask you. I was like, you got to do something on camera. You got to. You can't, you can't do them like that. You can't do the people like that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, like wrestling opportunities have popped up over the years, and I've just never been ready for that. Um, I'm not sure, like, physically if that's something that, like, is the fires there, but the art of it. It's yeah. always been there, you know, and when I was a fan, the women were the, my favorite part of the show. Yeah, I'm excited to see it. You know, I, I can't say that I'm, you know, I, I enjoy the women that I do see wrestle. You know, Thunder Rosa is one of my favorites. I think Charlotte, as much as I don't like Charlotte, her matches are crisp. They're tight. She can go. Becky can go. Sasha can go. Bailey can go. Uh, you know, Britt puts on entertaining matches. So... The women's women's wrestling is is fun to watch, but I don't know that I could watch like a whole promotion of it. But AJ sounds uh, excited for it, and she you know said in this interview that she never lost her passion for wrestling. Like she still loves wrestling, and this is her way to uh, to to kind of be a part of it again and to give back to it too to help build up future women. Uh, she, you know, she's an executive producer of WOW now, and she's going to be the color commentator. So she's going to have a big role with this company. So it'll be exciting to see. I think she'll do great. Um, I wouldn't be surprised just hearing her say that she still loves wrestling. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if she ever did randomly show up in AEW uh, somewhere down the line. But for now... We get her in WOW, and it was just nice to hear from her. It was nice to hear her pop up. I was always a huge fan of AJ when she was around. She was a very fun character. I don't know if people, maybe you don't quite remember, or maybe you weren't a wrestling fan back then, but AJ was really good. She was really good on the mic. She was great on the mic. She did a little pipe bomb of her own when she she shot on the Bellas one time. And, and you know, she's always just an entertaining character, you know, as the crazy girlfriend, as the uh, general, not, yeah, the general manager, whatever the fuck that role was. It's just good to hear from AJ. And the Freddie Prince p- podcast is really good, too. Um, I recommend throwing that one in your rotation. Because he's a great storyteller. He's he's humble. He clearly loves wrestling. Like you can hear it in his voice when he talks about it. Like he's excited. Like this isn't just a he's doing this because it's fun for him to talk about flat out. And you can hear it. You know what I mean? He doesn't need to do a wrestling podcast. He loves wrestling and he loves talking about those days and those times and and you know, so I recommend throwing that one in your rotation too. He's a smart guy. He's an entertaining guy, humble guy. Uh, he tells great stories, you know, great wrestling stories. Um, yeah. So moving on to the next. 
You know, we talked about AEW's huge roster early on in the show, and another guy that's kind of lost in the mix in the AEW roster right now is Miro. Where the fuck has Miro been? He was God's favorite champion. And now all of a sudden he's just nowhere. Miro was on the Kurt Angle show this week, talking about his whole career, the tank with John Cena and getting signed and all this shit. Check out this clip, though, of Miro talking about making that transition over to AEW as Kip Sabian's video game buddy and now becoming the Redeemer. Check out this clip. How do you get in contact with AEW and debut as Kip Sabian's best man for his wedding? Um... So at this point, you know, with the pandemic, you know, that uh, I, I got managers, you know, who do a lot of professional wrestling signings and stuff like that. So they got in contact uh, with Tony to show, uh, to see if he has any interest. Uh, no, for the first three months, what I did, I just this Twitch because I couldn't wrestle for the three months because all WWE contracts are three months at a time. Wow. That's ridiculous. Three months at a time. So the whole three-month release is not because they're giving you three months free. It's just because your contract is three months at a time to get renewed every three months. While in AEW, we have sure contracts. I signed a four-year contract. It's guaranteed for four years. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I did Twitch for the first three months. The first three months, I was just doing some Twitching. Then we got in contact with Tony. He showed interest. Uh, we talked about spots, you know, where can I come in? He had this vision about Kip and, uh, you know, because I think, well, Tony knew who I was from WWE and, and what I've done, but I also, I think he saw the, the last three months that I was twitching. So, you know, doing the Twitch stuff and gaming. So I think what his character idea for Miro came is from the twitching Miro. So that's why me and Kip started doing the thing. Uh, but then the, I had fun. The arcade match was absolute blast, you know, throwing arcades and beating people around. And it was an absolute blast. But then it just came to a time that it's time to move on because I just I just thought that this once again is going to limit my um, my growth. So um, we did the keep thing. I, I beat him up, made him punishment, made, punish him, and then I became the redeemer, man. Because I once again I was looking for things, and I've always been a man who loves God. I trust God. I, I love Him with all my heart. And now, why let's incorporate that in some shape or form into wrestling? And that's how the redeemer was born. Yeah, man. I mean, we were all ready for that angle to run its course. It was way played out. That was one example of. Bad booking that jumped out to me in the early run of AEW. <clears throat> um, you know, it was about a year ago now, if not longer. When Miro came in, and, and I was okay with Miro as the video, video game guy when he first came in. Because it was different. It was something we hadn't seen before. And he was doing the Twitch streaming, and people were... He, he was known for his live streams and that sort of thing. So at the time, <clears throat> I mean, the pairing with Kip Sabian was weird because I don't know that they're ever actually ever interacted ever and just all of a sudden they're best friends. Well, maybe, you know, uh, I haven't dove into it deep enough into the whole Twitch world, but maybe they were Twitch buddies or something. I don't fucking know. Anyway. When he came in, like, I was for that, and it worked for me for a little bit. <clears throat> but what I was kind of expecting was, which eventually happened, was for Miro to turn on Kep. You know, like, this is fun, you know, we're having a good time. But slowly but surely, like, you see these little just psycho moments where, like, the fun, cool video game guy just snaps for whatever reason. And you kind of see almost like Kip and Penelope almost getting scared of him here and there. <clears throat> and then he just snaps. And and to me, this should have happened no later than at Kip's wedding. Like, I thought when they were building to the Kip and Penelope wedding that Miro just should have. When he was like, I got one more, I got a present for you or whatever. And it was fucking Orange Cassidy. For me, like, AEW, like, 
lost so many booking points in my opinion that night um just because like to me it was a huge missed up we're gonna do really orange cassidy like all of that was set up for me to in my opinion for miro to beat the f- ever loving fuck out of kip Sabian. he eventually did but it was like weeks too late like a month or two after this even maybe it was sooner but what felt like way too late like where the angle was already all sorely played out and everything like they should have just i mean miro should have just killed kip Sabian, and he did i mean fuck we haven't seen kip Sabian since so i mean they did do that but it should have been at kip's wedding And that should have been the big shocking reveal at the wedding, not fucking Orange Cassidy in a box. And then, you know, Miro on the Redeemer run, like, that was the Miro I think we all wanted to see. We all saw the potential for that in his WWE character when he was doing his Bulgarian Brute run. And... That's what we wanted to see from him. We finally got it in AEW, and he had that great run as the TNT champion and and had a lot of great matches there. And just, I don't know where the fuck he is now. Uh, Apparently, he's healthy. He's not injured or anything. So I don't know if they're going to just bring him back with Lana. They're just waiting for it to cool off a little bit, or if they're just giving him an off season a little bit, you know, if they're just kind of rotating him out for now and they'll bring him back in with something strong. I don't know. I mean, there's no rule that says every guy has to be on TV at all times. But you don't want to just start to forget about guys and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, he still works there either. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the problem you run into with a bloated roster. It's not a bad problem to have. You want that stacked roster, and you want guys fighting for spots, and you want the problem of, you know, you got too many good talents that you you don't even – have a spot for all of them necessarily because if people get injured shit happens COVID especially now too like you might need to fill a spot quick you know on a dime so it's good to have reserves and stuff but you know have them sending in promos or beating people up or, or something I don't know I guess if you don't have a clear direction for him you don't need to be doing anything because he'll just be floundering but <clears throat> Why do you not? Why would you have a guy like Miro on your roster and not have creative for him? You know what I mean? That's all we got for you this week. I want to thank you for checking out the show. If you made it here all the way to the end, thank you so much for your time. I want to thank you for coming back to the show. I know I took a big break in between. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about that other than just life's rough, man. So. Uh, you know, I'm glad to be doing this. I hope to continue to do this each and every week for you guys going forward, just bringing you great wrestling podcast content and commentary and opinions and fun all at the same time. I would encourage everybody to follow me. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on Facebook. Like, subscribe, whatever that is, all at, at Seth Grimes Media. That's where you can find me across the board. You can also look that up on Spotify or Google to check out the podcast feed. I got a whole other podcast feed of other content that I do outside of the wrestling show. Um, Plus, you can, I got my first chapter of my book is on there as a sampler to see if you want to buy the rest. You can check out my book. I got a book called The Gathering A Bold Journey into the Belly of the Juggalo Underworld. It's about the dude that goes to the Gathering of the Juggalos Music Festival, and he hates Juggalos, so it's fun like that. It's a novel. I got an NFT project, Cryptomania NFTs. They are pro wrestling inspired NFTs. Right now, we have the uh, Wrestle Pals Series One available. They're like Funko Pop slash action figure slash trading cards of pro wrestling inspired characters. And uh, by pro wrestling inspired, I mean like the Brett the Hitman Hart has diamonds on his pants instead of hearts. Um, it's, it's how you get around the copyright, you see, because it's it's transformative now. It's not the same thing. Got other great projects in the works. Just 
follow me, like me, subscribe to me, all that shit. Or just leave your hate in the comments. You can do that too. Fuck off. You suck. I hate you. And I'll go cry in a dark room and suck my thumb and all of that. But uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you for checking out the show. Have a very great day. I'm your host, Seth Grimes. Peace, love, and pizza. This has been the Pro Wrestling Podcast. Podcast! I love that part. I love doing that. That's fun.